let's start with the next talk uh, about the Dart programming language that will be given to you by Lukas Tor from Red Hat. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody, and welcome to the Dart site. How many of you are familiar with Star Wars? No Star Wars fans? Seriously? Come on, guys. This is a joke. Seriously, laugh. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm Ladia Tong. I work with Red Hat. And in the free time, I try to contribute to Dart. Uh, given that I'm pretty vocal on the mailing list, I'm now a designated Google developer expert on Dart, which means that I should be able to answer all your questions, should you have any. Come on. Yes. Uh, if you do have questions, go ahead and ask. And there will be uh, some space for questions at the end of the talk. Anyway, uh, let's go. Uh, I'm going to speak about Dart the language at first. And at second, I will try to introduce a web UI, which is a Dart framework for building modern web applications. So, can you imagine half a million of lines of code in JavaScript? Raise your hands, who can't imagine? Oh man, that's impossible. Seriously? Yes. All right. <laughs> Google is doing it. This is uh, about Gmail, I think. Uh -huh. Gmail has about uh, 500,000 lines of code in JavaScript in a language that was designed in 10 days, which is pretty awesome. It's also a little bit scary. Uh, JavaScript wasn't, wasn't really designed for that. Uh, Google did realize they built closure tools, they built Google Web Toolkit, and in the same tradition, they are now building Dart. Dart as a language that can scale to this amount of code. So if you are frightened to write half a million of lines of code in JavaScript, like I am, let's say hello to Dart. Dart is a language that was designed for the modern web, uh, which means like, you know, web of applications, large applications that have to start fast, they have to be developed for a long time by large teams of developers, and it has to be uh, familiar, productive, it has to be performant, it has to be easily toolable. Uh, I will speak about uh, performance and tooling at the end of the presentation. Uh, for now, let's uh, take a look at the language itself. This is the canonical Hello World example. What do you see? Well, Dart the language is based on braces and semicolons, because you can't build a successful language without those. Um, there is a main function that's an entry point to the program. So you see that the program doesn't start at its first, as at its first line. It starts with the main function. Also, you see that you don't have to declare a class just to print Hello World. Right, uh, But Dart is a class-based language, so there's a very simple way to declare a class. Uh, let's take a look at this one. You see that there's a, there are two fields called name and age. There's a constructor, which has a short syntax for uh, directly, di direct, directly assigning uh, parameters to fields. There's a toString method, which also has a short syntax for method that only has one expression. You also see that there's a thing called string interpolation, so you can re evaluate expressions inside the string. And there is the, there's a main method uh, which just creates a new person prints. What do we see on this? The main, the most important thing uh, is that variables don't have type uh, declared. So you see Dart is a dynamically typed language. But I said that it has to be easily toolable, right? And tools, uh, IDEs and static analysis and stuff like that, they all depend on types. So what does Dart do? Dart lets you write optionally type annotations. But they don't really uh, affect meaning of the program. Why is that important? I will say a little bit later. Uh, well, the main function should have a return type of void, uh, but I personally have 
developed a habit of never writing void. I just omit it and it's just no, no problem. Uh, person me, well, that's pretty, pretty familiar to all Java and C sharp people, everybody. List of person, well, pretty weird to dynamically typed language to have generics, but they are there. Uh, they will scare uh, type theorists a lot because they are covariant. If you don't know what that is, uh, never mind. It's not important. Uh, if you do know, uh, go find me later and I will tell you that it's awesome. Um, there are list literals, like the brackets there. It's useful. There are also map literals with uh, curly braces. Uh, I think I have them in a later slide. What's more important, this for each stuff uh, shows how to how to write a closure or anonymous function in Dart. Again, there are two ways to do that. Uh, the first one on the on the first line is again an anonymous function that only has one expression, immediately returns that. The second one uh, with the braces means that there is a there is a block, uh, a list of statements. And the third one is quite advanced. It isn't used very often, but it's there and uh, it's pretty interesting. It's called closureization. It means that you take a function, but you don't write parents, so you don't invoke it. You just take a reference to that and it can be called later. Well, this one uh, doesn't really make closure, right? But it can. I can write, say, this me dot to string without parents. It will take a reference to the to string method, and it can be called later, and it will be called on the on the original object. So it does capture a context. Um, yes. So optional types uh, are the most uh, the most innovative thing in Dart. It isn't really new. It was in a language, in an ancient language called Strong Talk. Does anyone know that? All right, never mind. It was an optionally typed dialect of small talk. And it was really uh, the same person, the same people that are working on Dart were working on strong talk, so there's a strong influence. All right, so optional typing is the most, uh, most visible instance of concept called innocent until proven guilty, which is really, uh, uh, you can find it everywhere in Dart. Like, you know, if you have a m function that doesn't work yet, but you want to run a test that doesn't invoke that function, you can. You know, even if the function is you know, horribly broken, but you don't want to call that, you can still run the program, and it will fail only when it reaches uh, the bad stuff. Uh, which might sound a bit scary for you, if you are used to your IDE sketching everything, but the ID is for that will catch everything. It will just allow you to run the program, which is useful, uh, for example, when you're prototyping, uh, when, you're, when you're refactoring. Just, why can't I run, run the code? It's fine. Well, I can in Dart. All right. Let's take a look at a uh, few high-level uh, examples. Dart can uh, and does run in the browser. At first, uh, I'm going to tell you that there's a native implementation of Dart that isn't shipped in any major browser, which means that there is a compiler to JavaScript, uh, which expects actually ECMAScript uh, version 5, which means all, all modern browsers do that. If you are concerned about Internet Explorer, that's version 9 and above. So, yeah, that's a little bit sad. But, yeah, modern web. Uh, what do we see here at first line? Import Dart HTML. This shows uh, a bit about uh, Dart, uh, Dart uh, library system. Libraries are identified by URI. And, you know, I'm, I don't have much examples about libraries in the slides. But, you know, it's, it's there and it's needed. Uh, uh, what's more, what's, what's uh, next here? 
well, it's pretty easy to, uh, to read, right? Uh, it, it gives you a semi jQuery like uh, experience for writing the, the DOM. Like, you know, query button on click. Listen, well, it's pretty easy to follow, right? Uh, just listen on a stream of events. Well, stream is a pretty important concept in Dart. Uh, what I didn't say is that Dart is uh, pretty much asynchronous language in the very tradition of JavaScript. This is the only thing in JavaScript that I love. Uh, and the stream is actually something like asynchronous iterable. We've seen iterables here, right? The for each, for each stuff, like the, they have like this map, reduce, filter, so there is where actually. Uh, take while and drop while and, and stuff. And you have that on streams also. Uh, well, there's very little uh, sense in making stream for each, but transforming streams, uh, dropping some events from the stream, uh, that's, pretty, that's pretty useful, right? And uh, it's just there in the core library. Uh, who knows the term? The term functional reactive programming. It's a fancy way of saying the same thing. Uh, it got popular uh, with uh, reactive extensions for .NET. Uh, they did a really good thing and Dart adopts that. Right, so Dart runs on the client and it's the main focus today. But, oops, Dart also runs on the server. It's just, you might say, uh, Dart is Node.js done right, you know. Uh, this is a pretty small example uh, that shows how to create an HTTP server, which itself in Dart, well, uh, as of like five days ago, is modeled as a stream of requests. Again, totally asynchronous, nothing is blocking, uh, which is cool today. Uh, there's one more thing, it's called future, that you should be pretty familiar with. Uh, it's pretty similar to futures in Java, anywhere, except that there's no way to blocking wait for the future to complete. You have to always pass a callback then method. Just that this exact thing does uh, start in a server and when it's bound, it gives you in, it in a callback and you can listen for requests. Mm. I think this is it about this slide. Uh, yep. Yep. Uh, good question. Uh, and I totally forgot that. Uh, there are uh, three ways to run Dart today. There is a special build of Chromium called Dartium, which has an embedded Dart VM, which can run web uh, client side applications. There's a Dart to JS compiler which transforms Dart to JavaScript. You can run that JavaScript either in the browser or using Node.js on the server. And there's a standalone Dart binary, which has this Dart IO library, and you can run that from the command line. So you know you can write, uh, you can use that for, for writing command line scripts, even if it's not particularly good at it, but it, it can be done. And it's also uh, usable as a standalone server. I think, does that answer the question? Yeah, okay. Uh, I'm terrible at this. I always forget to repeat the questions. So <laughs> after the answer, I will tell you that the question <laughs> was, <laughs> how, can you run that, how, how can you run that on server? All right, uh, all right. This one is a little more complicated. Uh, and It's about isolates, which are, thank you, come on, come on. Uh, more people, more people. Uh, isolates are extra-like entities. Uh, you know, actors from Erlang. Anyone familiar with Erlang? Cool, cool guy. Uh, actors are awesome. Actors give you, well, we will have a, uh, a, tick, a talk about concurrency, actors, and a lot of stuff, right? Uh, and uh, in Dart, we have, uh, we have isolates which do work like actors a lot. So what are, act what are isolates? Today they are uh, separate threads that have isolated memory. You can't write 
to another isolate memory. You can only communicate using message passing. It's a pretty old concept, but it gives you concurrency without all the troubles with locking uh, and stuff. It also means that each, oh, come on, thank you. Uh, each object that's, that is passed uh, across isolates have to be copied. Uh, well, which means that sometimes it isn't exactly a great idea to, to do that, but, but for the scenarios like master workers, stuff like that, uh, it's pretty awesome. And again, it uses the stream abstraction. Maybe it's a little hard to follow on this slide, uh, but I'll try to explain. There's, there are two functions called main and worker. And the main function, there's the most important thing is uh, the spawn function uh, call. It's called stream spawn function because this is pretty much uh, in development, very much in development. Uh, spawn functions, again, takes a reference to a function, uh, to a top level function worker here. It spawns that in another isolate and uh, it returns a sync. Sync uh, is a way to push something to, to another stream. I hate that name, but whatever. Uh, and uh, here on this slide, I immediately call an add, which adds a map here to the sync. The map has a, another sync that will the, the worker isolate will reply to. Well, the worker is pretty easy. Uh, it has a stream, which is a uh, top-level variable that each isolate has. And it is a stream of, of messages that come to the isolate. Well, again, uh, it's a stream, you can listen on that. And each message, in this case, is a map, which has a reply to element, so that the worker will do something like compute something. Uh, this will take time. And then it will say message reply to, uh, which will get the sync, and add, which will uh, send the response to the original isolate. It isn't uh, immediately visible here, but if I had a top-level variable, like, I don't know, counter here, then uh, you, might be, you might want to like, increment it from the worker and try to read it from the main function. It won't work. Those are two different variables in two different isolates. Uh, I think that the most easiest way to, uh, to understand this is to try it. Actually, you can't put that in 10 lines of code. Let's take a look at another thing called mirrors. Mirrors are a way of doing metaprogramming in DARP. So, you know, if you have an object, there's no get class method. There's a, a big design principle behind mirrors that the meta level should be totally separated from the base level. So that if you have an object, you can't get, which is, an, which is on the base level, you can't get to a meta level just from that object. You know, uh, so you can easily, easily forbid metaprogramming just by uh, disabling the dark mirrors library. Well, you, can, you can do that, that's not a possibility, you can do that. Uh, when you are, for example, embedding the Dart PM into your own program, then the embedder is responsible for resolving all imports and can forbid dark mirrors. It's that, and there's no metaprogramming, and the program can, uh, the program is pretty much uh, safe. So that's a possibility you can, you can do. But if you want to do that, there's a, if you want to do metaprogramming, then the API is, I'd say, pretty similar to Java's reflection. Is here, like, reflect is a top level function in the mirrors library. So you reflect on a person, you get a mirror. And from that mirror, you can say, get field, set field, invoke, stuff like that. If you get a class mirror, you can say new instance, create uh, pretty basic stuff, pretty, pretty basic stuff. 
this is the only metaprogramming we have in Dart right now. In the future, we will be able to create new classes dynamically, modify even existing classes dynamically. But again, it will require using Dart mirrors. The base, the base of the language is, uh, is uh, free from that. You can't do all those dynamic stuff uh, that you are uh, that you expect from languages that from that from usual dynamic languages like Ruby or Python right yep it's an instance mirror there's a yeah yeah there's a there's a website called api.dartlang.org and there's a full documentation of the standard library and uh, if you reflect on an object then you get an instance mirror from that you can get a class mirror, uh, etc. Thank you. And again, I forgot to repeat the question. <laughs> All right. All right. And there's a lot more. Do we have time? I think so. Uh, we have uh, some stuff that is uh, devoted to the static structure of of the program, like you have, we have abstract classes. Well, you can instantiate that, but if you try to call an abstract method, then it will fail. Uh, we have properties, like they are pretty simple, like get name set age. Uh, it's pretty similar to Java's uh, getters and setters. Just stick a space in there, and it's done. Then. Uh, uh, what if I want to write a class, say a monster, that behaves uh, like a person? Well, I can do that pretty, sim pretty easily. It's a dynamically typed language. So I just, so I just write a uh, name and age, getters and setters, and it's done, and it works like a person. But if I want to say that I'm working like a person, I can just do implement person. And there are interfaces in Dart. But there's no interface keyword because each class uh, implicitly defines an interface. This one, for example, uh, has to support a name getter and an age getter and setter, which is done here by the final uh, variable name. Where variable is final, it implicitly defines a getter. And, it's a, and there's a variable called age, which can be modified, so it implicitly defines a getter and a setter. Uh, so yeah, we've got final variables. Uh, you can use that. It's also sometimes, sometimes it's useful. Uh, inheritance. I have never. <laughs> uh, I haven't spoke about inheritance yet, but it's there. It's a, a single inheritance, just like in Java or C sharp. But it also has mixins that are pretty similar to Scala. So uh, conflicts are resolved. Uh, according to the order of applications. Uh, well, yeah, uh, I think I could speak about that uh, for a while because there are some restrictions to make sense uh, as of today, but I don't think it makes sense. If you want to hear more about make sense, find me later. Uh, and some useful, useful stuff like optional parameters that can be named, like you see in the in the person constructor with the curly braces. Those are they, those you have to always name and, uh, and positional with the brackets. It's just a, a, a little useful stuff that is good for, for uh, designing readable a APIs. Uh, constructors, anyone has ever observed a final variable in Java that has two values? Me only, all right. It's pretty simple to observe a final variable that has two values. Before you, uh, you assign to it in the constructor, it has a value of null. Uh, well, initialization of objects is actually a pretty magical stuff in object-oriented languages. Uh, Dart tries to solve the, the initialization problem by requiring that final variables are always always initialized before the body of the constructor. Either using this, this dot 
field syntax, or which is the, fir in the first constructor, or using the so-called initializer list, which is in the second constructor, which also shows that there are named constructors. Again, pretty useful for designing APIs. And what's more, there are factory constructors, which single sentence uh, makes Dart constructors finally, finally Dart makes constructors properly encapsulated. It actually means that you can write, uh, you can write arbitrary code uh, uh, in the, into the factory and invoke that factory as a constructor using, in this case, new person dot cached me, and it will always return the same instance. Like this, pretty useful for evolving APIs. Like you can start with a simple, simple uh, class, and once you realize that you need something a little bit uh, extra for creating the classes, you switch to a, f a factory, and the client code doesn't need to know. And this is one, this one is uh, particularly useful. It's called cascades, which means that, uh, again, it's good for designing APIs. You can just invoke a lot of methods on the original object here called me, uh, ignoring the, the result. Because everyone is doing it with the fluent APIs, right? But they have to uh, design for that. You don't have to do that in Dart. Just, you can, you can do a cascade on anything. It's not exactly like width, because width gives you dynamic scoping, which is a bad thing. It only means that it takes, yeah, it, this, is the, this is just the sugar. It takes the original object, uh, he, me, me in this case, assigns a name, and forgets the result value, uh, and goes on to the original object and assigns an age. And I could invoke methods on this. Uh, like, you, you know, you can have a long, long uh, sequence of method invocations that can return values. But I don't care about those return values. I still invoke those methods on the original object. So, yeah, just a sugar. Uh, but a pretty useful one. Privacy in Dart. I will only say a few words about it. Privacy is scoped to libraries. So there are no private variables to classes or private to objects. It's just if a name starts with an underscore, then you can access it from outer libraries. It's uh, good enough for privacy, but it doesn't uh, bring a lot of craft, like, you know, should this be private or protected? And if protected, is it accessible from the same library on, or only or from subclasses and stuff like that? It's just a very simple but good enough uh, solution for privacy. No such method is a little bit of dynamics in language itself. Even class defines a no such method method, and you can call anything on that. And this particular class, class just forwards all, all invocations to the target object, but prints a message before that. So sometimes uh, that's useful. Right, so I have finished a short description of the language. I have not described everything by no means. So if anyone has a question about the language, now is a good time. Yep. Is there a type checking during compile time? Good question. Dart is dynamically typed, which means that in basic form, the types have ex no, no meaning to the program execution. But Dart does define a simple static type system, which is usable for IDEs, and IDEs will give you warnings based on types. And you can run the program in a so-called checked mode, which means that the annotations are actually checked, and if the type uh, doesn't match, it will throw an exception. Okay. Yeah. So I have two questions. First, to that, um, so today there are no IDEs that you specifically support it as of now, right? No, there are IDEs. There's a Dart editor, which is based on Eclipse platform. 
there is a plugin for Eclipse that's based on this Dart editor. And also IntelliJ Ideas supports that. Uh, JetBrains did write a official plugin for Dart that has some issues, but it does work pretty well. So there are already these IDEs. Yes. Uh, no, no big refactorings like move method up in an inheritance chain, but for the, but uh, the the plain old rename uh, does work quite well already. So, for example, if I move uh, my plugin from one package to another package, yes, this works perfectly. I don't think there is a move refactoring, uh, but at least it will give you warnings if something isn't, uh, if it can't find something, some, some class or something. And how about the scope modularization? If I want to break it, if I want to compile my scope into three different uh, uh, JavaScript? Yep, libraries. yep, good question. Uh, how about uh, compiling the code to, diff to three different JavaScripts or stuff like that? Uh, at first, uh, in the native Dart VM, there's no, uh, before, there's no previous compilation. You just feed it the source code. The source code is the primary mean of, of, uh, of deployment, of, of delivery, code delivery. And then the compil compiling to JavaScript, there are no, no uh, variants like in GWT. Uh, you only compile one Dart to one JavaScript for modern browsers. It works pretty well. Oh, uh, no. Well, it does compile JavaScript, the, w the whole Dart uh, program, which can be in a lo lot of files, to one JavaScript file. Uh, I'll tell you about libraries more, because it's apparently what, is, what this question is all about. You can declare a li library. A uh, library can have more files. And you can import libraries. It's just like that. Yep. No, there is a Dartium, uh, which is actually based, uh, which is a, a fork of Chromium, but it isn't a supported browser. It's just for development. For development, it's there, uh, so that you don't have to compile to JavaScript. But for running in actual today browsers, you have to compile to JavaScript. Is there at least um, like some time that this is going to be, this is going to work in default Chrome? Is, is Google yeah, yeah, uh, but it's Google, you know. Uh, Google actually looks like a lot of different companies inside one. Okay. So they have to really uh, persuade Chrome uh, people to include, uh, to include Dart VM into Chrome. Uh, it will probably happen, I'm not sure when. I can tell that uh, Dart 1.0 is, uh, so or they want to deliver Dart 1.0 some, somewhere this summer, maybe later. When it's uh, going or coming to Chromium uh, and Chrome, I don't know. And it does Mozilla have any attitude about this? They do have an attitude uh, and they say that Dart is trying to, to you know, fragment the web. It, they, will have, uh, they will have a really tough time uh, trying to persuade uh, other browsers adopting Dart. Yeah. There is possibly uh, a way. Uh, Opera announced that they will move to Chromium. So they might uh, get Dart from that. Like, if they don't do anything about it, uh, then Opera might get, uh, might get Dart from Chromium, which means that there would be two browsers. But still, uh, JavaScript compilation is an important part of Dart, and, and there was uh, already some uh, design decisions that I personally didn't like to support JavaScript compilation. So it's, it's, uh, it's an important, important thing for them. Thank you. Yeah? Go ahead. Uh, I can think that if any of your examples, mm -hmm. uh, then this would work. I mean, yeah. when I develop in JavaScript, mm -hmm. I often uh, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. This work, this, the this uh, keyword behaves as it should. It's okay. always lexically scoped. If you have a method in a class, then this always means the object of the class that the method is evoked on. Yeah. So if you call brackets, uh, this is an array, I can go up with, uh, I don't want to find a single column, it's something like uh, five. This is no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't, you don't need to do that. Why? Well, because this is always, always uh, the object. You know, it doesn't change if you if you invoke a function. But this, this won't change. Uh, I don't have that in the slides. But if you uh, have an object, uh, if you have a method, and you call, I don't know, uh, some collection for each and the closure, then in the closure. The, this keyword still means the object of the surrounding class. It's always, always uh, 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 lexically scoped. It's always uh, the object of the of the surrounding class. So it, it works differently than yes, it works differently than in JavaScript. It works the same as in Java or C sharp or any other civilized language. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, and a short, short introduction to Web UI. Web UI is a framework uh, to build modern web applications that's based on web components. Is anyone familiar with web components? No, but we don't have time to dive into that. I would like to. Uh, web components, well, I will. Short, short introduction to web components. Web components is a way to let you declare your own tags, basically. You can declare your own text. Uh, Model-driven views uh, for templating and implementation uh, for current browsers. You have to compile the code, but it works in current browsers. So how, how does it look like? This is the way how you declare your own tag. A tag called xCounter, which uh, has a companion class called counter, and it's a div. The element tag has two major parts, a uh, template and the script. A template is a plain old HTML with some templating, like you know, the value stuff, and, and uh, a way how to bind events, like this on-click stuff, which calls increment method, and the script part, which contains this. It's a class that extends web component, and that's pretty much it. One more thing that uh, this, this slide shows, the import package, uh, that's a sign of Dart package manager called pub. Uh, I'm not going to show that because we don't have time. And this is how it's used. Like you know, you can import components and you can use them as ordinary tags. Any questions about that? Or, yeah? All right. Uh huh. Uh huh. Oh, oh, no. Uh, increment parents. That's a method call. Yeah, and the plus one. That's a text in, on the button. All right. All right. Yeah. You. It. It can be a little more complex. You can have conditions and loops in there. This is a, a little table. Anyone has a question? Did I see? No, no. And you can pass values uh, to the component. Uh, so it, it, this, is, this is very much in development, uh, but it's pretty promising. Yeah, so I wanted to speak a little about performance. Dart is very much focused on performance, and they did make some uh, pretty awful design decisions to gain some performance. Uh, I can speak about that later. Uh, it's very much focused on fast startup. <laughs> if you remember that half a million of lines of code in JavaScript that powers Gmail, uh, that, uh, that code has to actually build a program at runtime at the beginning. It has to build a program before it can execute. That's why, like, you know, Gmail can sometimes take 10 seconds to start. So Dart uh, has, does a, a pretty strict approach to that. The first code that's executed is the main function. 
nothing executes bef be before that. If you have uh, static, uh, static variables in your classes, they are, they are initialized lazily on the first access uh, and stuff like that. And they are doing st stuff like, like they call diet parsing. I mean, they don't even parse the method bodies. They only check if they are well balanced, but they parse them on the first, on the first call and stuff like that. And fast runtime. Well, because Dart is pretty static in its structure, the Dart VM already beats V8, and about a lot uh, on some benchmarks, right? But it's already pretty fast, and V8 is one of the fastest runtimes for dynamic languages, right? So they do, uh, do, con do concentrate on performance a lot. And tooling, yes, I said already, there's an Eclipse plugin, there's an IntelliJ IDEA plugin, there are configurations for highlighting for Vim, Emacs, Sublime, uh, TextMate, stuff like that. And the most important thing that Dart is all about is bringing structure to the web. Like, uh, if I should say one sentence to describe uh, the Dart language, I would say that it's dynamically typed, but it's statically structured. And yes, this is the most important, uh, the most important URI, but I hope I persuaded at least some of you to go there. <coughs> some questions? There is, yeah. Uh, can I work? Can I uh, get the Dart Dart work with jQuery and some JavaScript libraries? There is a a library. There's actually it's a package. There's a package called JS which provides interop, interop with JavaScript. Uh, it's not totally awesome because you know if you have a native Dart in uh, in the browser uh, JavaScript and you have two virtual machines, you have two heaps two garbage collectors, and you have to uh, somehow solve uh, the problem of object disappearing. So uh, it's there, it's not totally pretty, but it works. Yeah, I think so. Or at least wrap it into your library. All right. There is already a lot of samples. There is already a big community that provides a lot of I don't know, programs, some frameworks already. There's, for example, there's a framework called Buckshot that's inspired by .NET and XAML. So if someone wants to write XAML-like <coughs> code in Dart, there's that. And uh, what about Google itself? No one knows. But there are some signs in the, in the sheet tracker that Google that some teams at Google are uh, at least evaluating Dart or planning to use Dart for, they, for their own work. But uh, <coughs> I guess that we will never know until they release something. It's Google. Yep? Uh, I've been uh, doing some work in the Google Forger library. Mm -hmm. It has very rich set of libraries. Yeah. What is the set of libraries? Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah, I don't know Clojure that much, but they do have a rich set of widgets, and <laughs> Dart does not. All right, the basic library is pretty rich. You know, there are collections uh, and streams, and there are some, well, the internationalization library is pretty rough, but it will be there. Uh, just go to the API Dart line. I think that you will find a lot of a lot of stuff there. There are some some things for crypto. Uh, again, very rough at basic. Uh, and there was a question out, up there, but we are out of time. So sorry about that. And come to me, please come to me. We are out of time. So thank you.